God, we feel your loving presence here. We're so glad that when others told us that you didn't love us for who we were, you tore down that wall, God, and you still came running to us and loved us. We're God's queer people in God's house this morning. And we're happy, God, that no matter what the diagnosis might be, no matter what the problem may be, you, oh God, are with us this morning. And we love you for it, Lord. We ask your blessing upon us. We ask your blessing upon your word. We ask you to open up our hearts to understand you this morning. In the name of beautiful Jesus, in the name of the Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of faith. So I was, getting, I was getting swept up there for a moment. I was getting blessed and feeling the presence of the Lord. I'm so happy that God allows us as God's children to stand up. You know, if you hear me say a lot the word God's queer people, I know that can be a little confusing for some people, especially those of us who are, who, who are baby boomers and we're being chased and beaten up by that word. You know, when we were kids and they, you queer, and then they would hit us and we would run and, and I'd be like, how do they know? But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but, but the millennial generation who I believe is God sent who is the reason why we had Barack Obama and gay marriage. <laughs> yes, yes. The millennial generation have decided to embrace that word and have turned it into a, into a movement. And so today the word queer means an umbrella term for all of the alphabet. It is LGBTQA and also the allies. So it, and allies are straight people who, who love us and accept us and want to work with us for justice. So, and we have allies here. Yeah. We love you. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have straight people that have defied the odds, and instead of being a part of First Methodist, they've come here to join us this morning. So we're grateful. We're grateful for them and for what God has given us here. So we're God's queer people here this morning in the house of the Lord. And we're continuing along with Adam Hamilton's uh, theme of half-truths and how destructive and dangerous they can be. And it just turned out that this one landed on my lap this week. As the Reverend Terry uh, asked me to preach on this, I was like, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So I have truth, y'all. So I hope you still love me at the end of this sermon. <laughs> but it's an important half truth for us to understand and to, uh, for us to talk about. It's an evangelical term that's been coined from, from the 20th century. And it basically is a postmodern saying that makes the claim that the Bible has made a statement and that the person faithfully believes it and that there's no other room for debate. As we continue to examine Adam Hamilton's half-truths today, we look at this phrase that is used mainly by our evangelical brothers and sisters, most whom do not love nor accept you, but nonetheless, it's used by them. And they believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and we are to follow it in a literal sense. And what Adam Hamilton is basically saying is, the problem here is that it oversimplifies the scriptures and this can lead to a lot of hardship for other Christians who may not fall in this bubble that certain members of society have created. And so that's what we have to look at this morning. And I want to start off by saying, let you know that I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. I love to wake up early in the morning with my cup of Puerto Rican coffee and open up the scriptures. You need that at 530 in the morning. And I start drinking my coffee, my cafe bustelo, and I, and I, and I, of course, I put some milk in it and some sugar because if you're going to have that coffee, you need some help. <laughs> but I love to wake up and there's a, there's something about opening God's word early in the morning and just reading the stories. The, the combination of the caffeine and God's word just really makes a real cool connection for me. To look at the stories of the lives of people and how inspiring 
and moving they are and how much it speaks to my heart. But sometimes that becomes a political paradigm. It becomes a conflict as we begin to look at how Scripture can sometimes be used against certain people who don't fall in the status quo of what others feel should be the truth. And as so many of us sitting here can relate, because you've been told since you were young that who you are and how you feel and how you think is wrong, because the Bible said it. And they'll come up and say that homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. And I remember when I was a kid, that would scare me, right? Because I was trying to act straight and everything, you know. Hey, what's up, Maria? You know, trying to act straight and everything. In the youth group, you know how it is when you're working with the youth group and all the sanctified sisters are praying for you. And you're like, oh, Lord, please not hurt. Please, Lord. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. And so you had to fake the funk. Right, hey, I love you, and walk like this. But really, it was Pepe that was winning your heart, you know. <laughs> so you struggled with that. And so when you heard that homosexuality is an abomination to God, it scared you. It made you like, oh, my God, I'm an abomination. But when you study the context, which in June, Reverend Terry is going to be looking at it more in depth. And so I encourage you to please attend in June as she explores homosexuality in the Bible. But when you look at the context, you start to realize that there's certain problems attached to how easily Scripture is used and applied in the context of who we are as God's queer people. There really is some problem with it. Let me give you an example. The Bible does not really have the word homosexual in it. Did you know that? Because the word homosexuality was not invented to the late 1800s. And so yet we've interpreted and translated it and put it in the Bible and now you're scared. So I want to be able to start opening your heart to understanding that there's a lot more to this truth. And I want to do it by starting off by reading a biblical example that Adam Hamilton uses. Let's start off by looking at Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14. And this is the New American Standard Version. And so um, it says, this is the word of God, y'all. Ready? You shall also have a place outside the camp and go out there, and you shall have a spade, which is a little shovel, among your tools. And it shall be when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and shall turn to cover up your excrement. You know what that is, right? All right, here we go. God's word. God's word for you this morning. I hope you have your shovels with you. Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy, and he must not see anything indecent among you, or he will turn away from you. That's an interesting scripture. It's in the Old Testament. And the truth of the matter is, is that when it was first used, that we used for a purpose with Israel, but today... We apply it in a different way. Now, to you going to the bathroom and digging, going outside up there by the bushes over there to go relieve yourself with your little shovel makes absolutely no sense to you, right, in this postmodern era that we live in. But did you know that in the late 1800s, this scripture became a source of controversy in the church? In the American church, it became a big divide as something happened that was revolutionary, right? Historically, Queen Victoria and England got tired of going to the outhouse, and someone came up with the brilliant idea that if they got a toilet and they put it inside the house with a little separate room, that Her Royal Majesty can go in there, and she can take a number one, or she can take a number two, and then she just had to flush it, and it was gone. And that was revolutionary. Now, you don't see it revolutionary because we all have toilets in our home. Hopefully, most of us do here in the United States. <laughs> we no longer use outhouses, right? And so as this technology started to sweep the United States of America at a time when urban centers were being built and created, people began to have toilet bowls inside their home. And the big marketing thing was new apartment with the toilet bowl. Just go in, sit down, use the bathroom, and flush, and it's gone. Well, that became controversial in the church because some ministers started to say, wow, what a great idea. Instead of the outhouse, let's have toilets inside the church. And so they started to instill toilets inside the church. And some of the hardcore 
biblical-based Christians who believe that God said it, I believe it, now that settles it, believe strictly in the word of God, became upset with that and started to say it is unholy to have toilets in the house of the Lord. And they started to use this verse to preach against it. And a big divide came upon Christianity. There were those modern thinkers who felt that it was okay to have a toilet inside the church, and then there were those who were against it. So there were those who had toilets and those who didn't have toilets. And the ones who didn't have toilets felt they stood for the truth of the Word of God and that they were righteous before God because they obeyed all of the Scripture they didn't have toilets in their church, so they were the toiletless people from God. <laughs> and they preached it, and they believed that, and it became a huge fight, which for us today sounds ridiculous, and it sounds absurd. Preachers also started to preach against the automobile because they said that it is the horse that God has made, and that is natural for you to ride a horse. And get ready for this. It was unnatural for you to drive a car. Unnatural. Does that sound familiar today? Don't they use that phrase for us saying it's unnatural to love a man and another man? Or it's unnatural for a woman to love another woman? It's unnatural is the context of how that scripture was used to oppress people back then. And Hamilton says that this is a problem because it becomes a pick and choose of a social positioning and culture. It becomes a pick and choose, and, and it's, it's, it's relevant to the fact of where you are, what he calls a social position. And why by that he means that it's basically where you come from, no matter where your culture is, no matter where you live at, that's how you understand God's word. But the problem he debates is that the using of scripture is seen today to marginalize and oppress certain people in the world, such as those of us sitting here. And we're told over and over again, it's an abomination. And they use the word homosexual that did not exist when the writers of the scriptures were, were forming their, their, their writings. And yet they use it against us today. And it's really interesting because if you look at that context, if you look at where they get the fact that homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord, attached to those are certain other texts. For example, it says you cannot wear two fabrics or sow two different seeds in your field. So you can't have two different type of cotton or, or some other material with you because it's an abomination to the Lord your God. Then I love this part. You have to eliminate pork and shrimp from your diet because eating pork and eating shrimp is an abomination to the Lord your God. And I would like to see how Puerto Rican pastors are going to get away preaching to their congregations, telling them they can't have pork. That ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. You go tell them Cubans they can't have that pig, and you watch what's going to happen. You tell that Dominican they can't have that pig skin, you watch what's going to happen. Oh, those Pentecostal preachers will preach against you being a homosexual, but they're going to keep their pig in their house. They're going to keep that fernie and that fried deep pig skin, which is, by the way, delicious. I know some of y'all don't eat that stuff, but some of us do. <laughs> but it becomes an interesting concept. It becomes an interesting debate as we look at how Scripture is used within these social contexts. And you see, the problem with this, Hamilton says, is interpretation. Because when you look at the Gospels, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. It was written in Greek. And it was translated into English. And so within that process... Interpretation becomes a problem. Let me give you an example for those who speak Spanish here. How do you say goodbye in Spanish? It's a very, don't try to answer it. It's a very interesting concept, right? Because in our American culture, we say goodbye and we leave. But in Spanish, there is no word for goodbye. You can say hasta luego, which means until later. Or you can say adios, which means unto God. But you can't say goodbye. Go ahead, those of you who speak Spanish. There's no direct word for goodbye. And don't say ciao because that's Italian. <laughs> that's a problem with translation. And that's the same problem we have here in Scripture, that there are certain concepts and words that you cannot directly translate. Thank you. But the debate this morning becomes, I need to move really quick here because I'm realizing I'm getting caught up. And I know that here, at, that, that this is not First Pentecostal. We don't do 45-minute sermons up in here. 
But anyway, that's okay. I promise you I won't go there. Um, um, but the truth of the matter is, is that the source of the word here becomes inspiration. God inspired the authors. If you would have gone up to Paul and told Paul, Paul, 2,000 years from now, the letters you are writing are going to become part of Scripture and part of the Word of God, Paul really would have freaked out because he had no idea he was writing a, a letter. He was saying, dear fulano de tal, <laughs> I noticed that some of you are having some problems, so I want to straighten it out, and here are the problems. Oh, by the way, there's some guy in your church who's sleeping with his stepmother, and, and that's what he was addressing. He had no idea that was going to become Scripture. If he did, he would have really freaked out. If you would have gone up to Peter and said, Peter, there's going to be a letter called First and Second Peters, and people are going to look at it equated to the Word of God, Peter would have really been freaked out. Because when they say all Scripture is inspired by God, they're referring to the Hebrew Testament. They're not referring to the New Testament. And so they would have had no idea, but yet we feel that today that God inspired them. And so when we use the word inspiration, we're talking about God breathed. And that God moved, and it's very similar to how an artist may look at a, at, at a sunset over a mountain and become moved by it over the set of mountains and go and look and paint a beautiful picture. That is inspiration. It isn't that God sat behind these writers' ear and said, okay, write this down because this is going to happen. It wasn't like that. They were inspired and moved by God. For to us, the inspiration of the Scripture is the moving of God in people's lives and them giving a testament for it. So this morning, my message in wrapping up is basically this. Do not feel condemned when people tell you that because of who you are and who you love, that you're an abomination to God. That's a misinterpretation of the scripture. And for those who said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, then they throw you out their Thanksgiving dinner. I want to let you know that they are not practicing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Christ is love, and Jesus didn't condemn you, and Jesus said nothing against you. And what Jesus did is he fought for justice. He fought for the yeah. oppressed. He, felt for, he fought for the marginalized. He took women and put them in his ministry. He touched the leper. He raised the dead. He did everything that we weren't supposed to do. So he becomes this morning our example. Jesus Christ becomes the one who we look to because he loves us and he accepts us. So, in spite of what they may tell us, in spite of what they may say against us, we understand that there's a deeper truth of love. There's a deeper gospel of freedom. So understand that Jesus loves you. There is therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no hatred. There is nothing but love. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church of the Jesus Christ says... Amen. Amen. That's right.